All right. So welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am super excited to have Amy Pope with me here today. And now Amy is based in Dubai and I don't often have other guests from this region, the UAE. Most of my guests are elsewhere, like, you know, Europe and North America. So it's really nice to have another UAE guest here. And Amy is a change coach and she also does a form. She's a meditation facilitator and she's created her own kind of practice called Shake and Flow, which she will tell us more about later on. Um, But welcome, Amy. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. So lovely to be here. Lovely to meet you as well. So I want to hear, I'm always interested to know how people end up in Dubai. So how did you end up here? (laughs) Yeah, so I um, moved to Dubai in 2015 uh, because my husband was already here working. He'd already been here a few years. So I visited quite a few times, but hadn't made the actual move because it was a big decision to make. Moving away from family, friends, job, you know, it's it's a big deal. But I did it. I made the decision in 2015 and I flew over here with a potential job offer and also my two cats. So they were with me in the hold. I was thinking about them the whole time on the flight for seven hours, worried about how would they be okay. And I got here and the first thing I did was just want to find my cats. And we went running around. We had to go through quite a lot of uh, red tape, lots of offices lots of admin things to fill out. And then I got taken to this massive warehouse and there was quite empty, actually. I remember it being quite empty. And then in the middle of this really big warehouse, my two cats were just there in in their carriers. And I was running up to them and there were some workers around and they just came up to me and they said, what are they? (laughs) And I said, the cats. And it was just really funny. It was like my first real experience of Dubai. You know, they, I think they thought they might have been quite an exotic animal. They were quite <laughs> plump. Very wow. well-fed cats from England. Um, so that was lovely that I brought them here. And I used to work in the insurance industry in London. And like I said, I got a job offer pretty much straight away here. But it was put on hold as well really quickly, um, which was a real shame. And then I waited and waited for, for that to come through. And then it just didn't happen so I then looked for another job and got that very quickly as well they instantly offered it to me on the spot but they then said within literally the same breath we can't hire you immediately because we do not have enough visas wow so yet again yeah I was kind of up against a bit of a wall and uh, had to wait again but I waited for a while and in that time, because I wasn't working, I was kind of trying to meet new, new people, socialising. So I got really into the Dubai kind of lifestyle, the nightlife, the ladies' nights, which they are a lot of here. Yeah. And so I was you know, drinking quite a bit, not having to worry about getting up for work. So I, I got really into you know, the expat lifestyle very quickly. Um, but then a few months down the line, I was then given, given luckily, an, an opportunity to work with my sister. And we set up a regional office here of her recruitment agency. So I did that for a few years, uh, which I absolutely loved doing. And although it was a completely different industry to one I'd worked in before, you know, I did, I was in insurance for so long, I never thought I would do anything else. And then this came along and I really realized that actually you can change your career at any time at any age and it really is possible so that was really awesome and yeah that's where I ended up in Dubai (laughs) wow and you know when you talk about the ladies nights and the brunches Mm. I honestly feel like people who don't live here don't get it and describing the complexities of this region like I had someone I actually interviewed someone last night and she asked me about drinking in the Middle East and it's just so interesting like you know so I was in Kuwait when I first moved out here and in Kuwait alcohol was completely illegal and so like the brunch was not a thing but we would fly out of Kuwait and come here to go to brunch on the weekend and I the way I think it is is because the local culture is not um you know alcohol is forbidden I don't think they have the same education awareness and progressive laws the same way that countries that have had you know alcohol abuse for like 
you know, hundred years in Canada. So for example, I know in Canada, like they can't sell unlimited drink packages. You can't start drinking at noon. You can't give women alcohol for free. Like these things you cannot do in Canada. And that's to prevent things happening. Like, you know, the state I got in. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's everyone's responsibility, how they indulge. But I do think here, because there are less preventative laws around it, there's just so much wildness that people just mm. back home can't even imagine. It's like you're on, it's like you're in an all-inclusive resort on vacation forever. <laughs> that's how I describe yeah, that's it. A, that's a really good description of it. Yeah. It, it's just available so freely, which is also such a strange thing to say, but it, it really yeah. is, but you're right. It, it is our personal responsibility. But it's also really, it's really easy to get carried away yeah. when everything is so, uh, you know, there and everyone is on a holiday kind of, we're almost like we're on permanent holiday here. You know, totally. we live in a very warm country, uh, you know, the beaches that are there, you know, we have these hotels on offer. Yeah, it is a great life. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And then there's this whole part of it that comes with it. If you want to go down that route, which I did for a long time, it wasn't, healthy for me you know ultimately is and and that's where I've got to in my life uh, but to to just kind of switch it up which I'll get I'll get to as well because it's all well and good going out and starting brunch at 12 o'clock and that drinking until I think it's usually like three or four hours you get yeah but no one very rarely people stop and Mm -hmm. I know I certainly didn't you know it would carry on you'd have the extra you know coupons for some half price drinks and you know, mm-hmm. oh let's carry on and it was hard to stop um yeah which is what happened to me and that my my parties would be you know potentially 12 hours me you too. know I, yeah and then the hangovers would just be oh days <laughs> last thing so it was it wasn't great it wasn't like I got myself into any particular trouble or anything like that. It mm-hmm. just, it was just the general feeling of it and the not really being able to control myself, I think is the big, the big factor there. And the, my relationships probably did suffer from it as well because you didn't, you don't realize at the time because you're like, woohoo, let's just have a great time. And I just yeah. love to party. But then, yeah, when I reflect back, I'm like, hold on, I treated my husband like this. Or, you know, you know maybe I wasn't really fully there with my friends, things like that. So, yeah, right. now I know because I don't drink anymore. It wasn't, it's not the right journey that I wanted to be on, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And so you came in 2015, which is actually the same year that I came to the Middle East, oh. um, which is cool. So how long yeah. were you in like the expat drinking scene? Like at what point did you stop? And what was that like? Yeah, so I, I stopped so I already, I already was a big drinker. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I, I drank a lot in the city of London. I worked there for many years and that was a, you know, a big, big life. And it was a bit of my lifestyle. But when I became an expat, it definitely, definitely stepped up a gear for sure. Like I said, the ladies nights and things. But the turning point for me was actually when my, my mum died very suddenly and it was a real shock. That was in April 2019 and she was 68 she had there was no indication that she was unwell whatsoever um if anything I thought she'd be you know around for so long and uh, living with me maybe later in life when I live in Ibiza which is my spiritual home (laughs) um she she even used to send me um apartments (laughs) so I knew that she was really up for it as well but um when that happened it was such a shock and I needed to change. I knew something had to give, something had to change for me to be able to actually cope with the loss and the grief that was coming in so quick and fast. And I just thought, this is, this is what has to go. It has to be alcohol. Wow. And so I made this big decision that, yeah, alcohol was just going to, you know, I was going to just leave um, alcohol behind. And it's really interesting, actually, because my mum really was worried about me partying a lot. She always used to worry and used to actually say, I never thought you'd stop, you know, I thought you'd stop partying. And my reply would always be, never going to happen, you know, laughing, yeah. <laughs> smiling at her. And uh, now I can actually say I have, you know, I did do it. And that's another thing. I really wanted something good to come out of her, you know, sudden uh, death and passing. So what I did, I actually, I bought the Alan Carr 
book, How to Stop Drinking. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Yeah, um, I have. Yeah, so I, I, which I bought and I actually put it off reading for a while because I knew, I just knew it was going to work. Um, I'd actually used his book to stop smoking a few years before. I just knew. I just knew. So as soon as I read it, that was it. It was done. It was almost done before I started reading it, you know, and, um, and uh, that was it. And I literally have not looked back. Uh, so wow. that's been two and a half years. Yeah. Wow. And, and when was that that you quit? Because I also quit in 2019. So when did you quit? May 16th was the day. Wow. So I quit April 13th. That's so interesting. We have really yeah. parallel stories in that we came yeah. to the, the Middle East at the same time. We quit drinking around the same time. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. What was yours like? What happened when you started, when you stopped then? Did you, did you I, have a trigger as well that we all need sometimes? <laughs> you know what it was? I was really struggling with my mental health. And it was really bad. Um, And my life was kind of like, so I came over here. I was a teacher. I didn't like teaching at all. I was just kind of, that was my job. (laughs) That's what I finished my degree in. That was what I was doing. I wasn't very happy. When I was in Kuwait, it was really bad. I was in a really toxic work environment. And I got very fortunate and moved to Abu Dhabi and was at a very lovely school. Um, Amazing work environment, amazing colleagues, amazing campus. Like it was all good. And I was got really into the brunch life. And I kind of hit this point, maybe... I think I was a year and a half after I made this shift to Abu Dhabi where I said, you know, everything is right in my life right now, everything I wanted. And why am I still so unhappy? You know? And yeah. I looked around and I was like, okay, I'm broke. <laughs> I'm, mm-hmm. I'm working out like, cause at this point I was a yoga teacher. I was working out like five, six days a week, doing all different kinds of things, spin, bar, pump shape. And I still didn't feel very healthy. I had no money. Mm-hmm. I was really depressed And I kept kind of started Googling like how to quit drinking. And I started receiving targeted ads for one year, no beer. (laughs) And it's a good one. I just saw these amazing stories of people having transformed their life. And so there was a period of time where I could not quit because, you know, the expat life, you know, like I had a trip to Norway, I had a trip to Southeast Asia, Special Olympics was coming up, friends were visiting. I was going with my mom to Morocco. So I was like, I can't quit. And then um, on the trip to Morocco, I just kind of was like, you know what? After I get on the plane, I'm going to do like a 30 day break. And so got on the plane was like, okay, this is day one. And, um, two weeks into it, I was like, wow, I never want to drink again. (laughs) Like it was just that extreme of like, wow, I'm so much happier, so much healthier, you know, Mm. everything, my life just transformed. And now I'm like, why would I ever want to go back to that? (laughs) You know? So it wasn't so much of a big trigger as in, as you had like a life changing moment. But for me, it was just a big buildup of like, there's got to be more to life than this, you know? Absolutely. And that's the thing that you mentioned about reasons. We have so many reasons why not to. We can yeah. put up, you can have so many, like my friend is coming to visit, especially as we live in this world. You know, oh, I've got this plans, this plans. And there's just so many reasons not to. Yeah. But there are, once you do it, there's only one reason to do it. And that's because it is amazing to, to have an alcohol-free life. And that's, that's why, um, why I do it. And that's why I've continued to do it. And it's not been, you know, it's not been completely easy. You know, um, there's still been wobbles and times when I've just gone, oh gosh, you know, do I really want to not drink? You know, um, I was even around on my first actual brunch that I went on that I didn't drink at. That was a bit tricky, actually. I had a bit of a physical reaction to being told by my friends that, um, I might as well get the alcohol package because it would be cheaper than having the non-alcohol package. Now, in their eyes, it was completely reasonable to say that to me. And, mm-hmm. you know, absolutely. But I just had this complete, like, <gasps> like anxiety meltdown because I thought, you know, you're, I'm being told I, I, to have the alcohol package when I don't want it anywhere near it, if that makes sense. I just yeah. didn't want to have it. And, um, and it ended up being absolutely fine and uh, I had a great time but uh, it was just that, um, that physical reaction to no I don't want to be I don't even want that option to be given to me so that, that was quite um, a big um, it was interesting to see how I physically how I reacted so much to that yeah, yeah and I, I did learn from it that was in you know the early early days and also I don't know if you've ever been to Georgia no I haven't so Georgia's this incredibly beautiful, lovely country. And I went there 
about few, three months after I visited, I stopped drinking. And I really struggled there because you would not think it, but there's just wine everywhere, just everywhere. Um, it's the home to the oldest wine ever discovered, I think, 8,000 years ago. There's advertising for it. As soon as you come out of the airport, there's like this giant boarding of wine bottles so it's, it's just everywhere and it's sold and drunk on the corners streets and they absolutely love love wine that's one of their favorite things i think in the world and they, our hotel room even had a the key ring was a wine cork that's how much they love wine there and i was a, that was my big drink i was i was basically loved wine and i spent most of my time especially in that trip uh, just channeling this quote that um, was in the book called The Sober Diaries by Claire Pooley. And she quoted, she did a misquote from Kate Moss. Um, and it was, wine doesn't taste as good as being sober feels. And I just remember replaying that quote over and over in my mind, thinking, no, it's, it's okay. You know, this is so much better to feel this way. And I got through it. And I will go back to Georgia as well, because it's so incredible. But uh, it was quite a, whew, a sensory yeah. shock, I think, yeah, to do that. That's hard. Um, Vacations mm-hmm. sober are really hard in the early days because yes. it's like, well, for me, it was like I was used to drinking and I was terrified. I actually almost canceled my first vacation. I was going to Paris. I almost canceled it because I was like, I can't do it. Um, yeah. And I got really fortunate. This is a, a really crazy story. I met this guy in Morocco with my mom in the Sahara desert. And I had already booked a flight to Paris like for three months later. So I met him when I was still a drinker and I booked a flight to Paris, maybe like hundred days later. And he was like, Oh, stay at my house. And this was like this 60 year old, like physics prof. It's Parisian man. And at the time when I met him in Morocco, I was like, this guy's so boring. Cause he didn't really drink. And he just wanted to talk about like science and like art and like this guy's so boring. Cause you know, I just wanted to get drunk. And then a hundred days later, I was like, wait, this is actually the perfect person to, to have a vacation with. <laughs> and so I got really lucky in that he invited me to stay at his home and he took me around and I had a very like art and cultural experience of Paris. And um, it really helped me stay sober. Cause I think if I was on my own, I probably would have ended up wanting to drink, you know? Mm. Um, so I got, re- that was my first vacation experience, but um, I totally get like how hard it would be and how hard it is for some people. Absolutely. Yeah. But you're, you're quite right though. It does completely change your holiday you know you Mm -hmm. you can be you do become more open to wanting to experience the country you know more more culturally rather than the party aspect you know I used to always drink on the first day because I just got so excited that was like my big thing excitement and then so the next day was always a bit of a write-off and then but then we'd kind of change it up you know I'd, I'd kind of mix it up but there was always alcohol you know from the moment you get to the airport you know, the drinks start flowing and on the plane, the drinks are yeah. flowing. It's, it's, um, it's really interesting. I remember my first kind of time I did, I did business class and they asked, offered me um, the champagne, which is, you know, I used to, I would have always loved it. And I just thought, no, no, I don't want that. Just give me some orange juice. And I was so aware and so conscious of the fact that drink is so freely, again, available on these trips, on these, on these flights. You know, yeah, you have a bar on the um, incredible A380, but there's this, you know, bar where people will go and sit for hours and hours. I've done it once before myself. And um, you'll arrive at the destination feeling absolutely terrible. And now I just, when I arrive anywhere, I feel, you know, maybe a little bit tired, perhaps, depending on the flight time, but you know, oh, just ready for the, for the trip rather than thinking, oh my God, I need my beds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Mm. Yeah, gosh, holidays, eh? Well, we can have more than now anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me about, okay, so that was your trigger to stop drinking. And mm. what was like the hardest, um, so two questions, the hardest and the best parts of the sober journey? Yeah, so the hardest was, I think, well, I kind of mentioned it really, it was, uh, it was just those, the first, doing the first yeah. things of anything, I think is probably the hardest thing. Um, you know, like it's the first holiday, the first time you go out with your friends when you're not drinking. Definitely, definitely the hardest thing. Um, I even sometimes might suggest don't go out with people so much at the beginning, perhaps if you can avoid it or at least drive. But um, if it feel, if you feel like that strongly about potentially drinking, 
Um, but once they're done, they are done, and, and, you, and you can put them out of the way. Um, the best, there is definitely a lot more best things about it than hardest things. Um, there's just so much uh, amazing things uh, from not drinking. I even actually set up a sober Instagram account. Um, this was at July 2019. I ran it for about a year or so to basically have accountability and yeah. to mix with uh, you know like-minded people that were going through similar similar things. And it was a real um, it was a real benefit. It really helped me at the time. I was really glad I did it. I was um, anonymous. I, I did um, I did come out and introduce myself near the end. And I, at that time, I listed around 50 things that I found where I learned along the journey, uh, which I'm not going to list here <laughs> because, <there are> just, <laughs> like I said, there were just so many. I, just, yeah. I, I found 50 so easily. Wow. Um, but the few top ones, I would say, is um, <sighs> never having a hangover is, does not get boring. I can't, just, I just can't say that enough. You know, it, it really doesn't get boring. Um, and also getting to know who you are as well. That was yeah. a really wonderful experience for me. I, I always used to think I was such a party girl and that was all I was, you know, that was my identity even. And it was a bit scary to lose that identity, but I found out so much more about myself and my confidence grew. And yeah, like I'm now facilitating meditations and shaking at events regularly and doing classes. It's not something I ever thought I would be able to do in my life yeah. so that was quite quite a big deal and uh, as soon as I removed alcohol as well I just started focusing on my well-being yeah and that was something I'd never ever done before I began to develop yoga practice in a way that I'd never done before again and discovered meditation and just really fell in love with that part of the journey and my eating habits as well they they naturally just started to change it was it was like a kind of one thing started off a trickle of like others like a domino effect and I by the end of 2019 I became vegan and I'd lost wow. almost 20 kgs in wow. weight as well yeah so it was a whole big change outside and in yeah Wow. And I, same thing. I was um, vegan for a while in my early days in sobriety. Now I'm back to vegetarian, but yeah. And I also lost a ton of weight too. Um, it just mm -hmm. kind of like, I just naturally, I wanted to move my body. I wanted to exercise. And then it just kind of went from there. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I used to be, I used to love, love yoga before I stopped drinking, but I never used to be able to really um, focus on it fully because I was there was so many times that I would wake up and have a bit of a hangover and just say, I just can't go today. You know, and the connection just was not there. Mm -hmm. And the moment that we removed this, I don't know what to describe it as. It's just this, this kind of numbing part yeah. of us. Um, we become like everything. I see things more clearly. Everything became just like, ah, oh, wonderful. And the world is, oh, hello, world. <laughs> there you are. Uh, it was, it was mad. And I just became more connected to myself as well. And yeah, it was, it's been a really unique, I, I mean, everyone's journey is obviously special and unique to them, but it was, it was just, um, it's been wonderful. And I cannot overemphasize what a wonderful way it is living without alcohol in in it yeah. and I know I have friends that have stopped drinking but may go back to having the odd drink here and there I'm not sure if you have the odd drink here and there I know quite a few people do but for me I don't actually feel the urge or the need to I just yeah. don't want to so um that's where I'm kind of at two and a half years down the line who knows where I'll be in five or ten you know yeah <laughs> but, yeah I just you just gotta be in the present haven't you and feel how you feel now yeah so I definitely mm. I don't desire to ever be drunk again, um, ever. I don't want to lose touch with the present moment ever. I don't want to forget anything. Um, I don't want to have hangover anxiety. Like I don't desire that at all. I have had a couple occasions after I hit the one year mark where I was at a staycation in a hotel and I did order a beer. And that was because it was like, well, it was like, I was at an all-inclusive, like the all-inclusive with the Rexos. I really wanted to have one. They didn't have anything alternative for me. And I actually don't even think I finished the drink. And so I do actually feel pretty good about myself because I feel I've talked with some of my clients about Andy Ramage and he has this concept of like, you know, total control over alcohol, which is like the state you want to be in where you can take it or leave it. And it's not going to like 
trigger you into this drunkenness. And so it was a good thing that happened to me because I feel really good about the state, the state that I am, but I also now, um, I, I started, someone talked to me about packing and bringing alcohol free beverages with them on vacation when I had them on the podcast. And I was like, that's really smart. <laughs> and I'm not really flying good. out of the country. So I, I order from yeah. drink dry store now, every time I go on vacation and sometimes they deliver it at the hotel room and then I have it in the room and then I just have that instead. And so that's, that's the only real trigger for me is that. Um, but yeah, if I have those then I'm good and I don't need anything. So yeah, that's so, that's such a good idea. And the um, drink dry store has been an incredible, um, yeah, um, it's just been great having that here, really. As soon Amazing. as I discovered it, I was like, yay. Um, because in the, back when I visited the UK, um, obviously not for a long while because of COVID, but we went back there this summer and the uh, the alcohol-free options are so good and yeah. are so available. And we don't have them sadly quite as much here. Not in the restaurants either. I think that's sort of the key. That's where I would like to see them, you know, in the actual restaurants where I'm out for dinner uh, or when I'm on the brunch and I can actually have a glass of non-alcoholic wine and not f- feel like I'm, you know, a little bit different. Because that's a lot. Of, that's another thing that people worry about is being different and yeah. going against the norm. Yeah. And that's what scares a lot of people, yeah, into not doing it. Uh, I mean, I, I do like to have my favourite probably go-to drink is the non alcohol mojito mm-hmm. but even after a while they kind of you know sit funny on the stomach and yeah you know, but yeah if they can bring in the non-alcohol prosecco and the wine I think it would be quite a nice addition to the restaurant scene here and I think I think they would have a lot of people um enjoy it I uh I went to this um it's not alcohol related, but it's vegan related but a similar thing the uh, I went to this place in Wales when I visited the home just recently and they had vegan magnums the ice cream and I said oh yes I can't wait I have to have one I was so excited and they said oh they're sold out I said oh my gosh how can they be sold out and she said they literally were the first ones to go they hadn't under ordered they'd ordered exactly the same as the other magnums and they were gone and it's just like it's supply and demand you know they they put them there people will definitely go for it because so many people want to maybe live that a little bit healthier or do something yeah. vegan for the planet. A lot of people do it for, but, uh, you know, the same can happen for alcohol as well. If we just give people the option, I think that's the key thing, the choice. I totally um, agree. Yeah. And that's something that I hope to for the future, um, with the UAE. I did meet a woman actually when I was in LA who told me that she, she really didn't want to be different at the brunches. Um, she didn't want people to notice that she had stopped drinking because she was kind of the life of the party. So she actually told me that she calls ahead to the hotels and many of them, if she speaks to the manager, actually let her bring a bottle of drink dry store wine in her purse. (laughs) And so she actually brings them into, like she said, especially the Rotanas. Um, The Rotanas have been really, really good with her. And they even bring, they, so they all are aware she's coming in and she's, you know, brought her little ice bucket and they even set it up for her like that. And so she said, it's been great, but she does have to, you know, have a long conversation, explain why get on the phone with, you know, it's like, it's not just like that, like they're, they won't just let you bring it in, but if you have a conversation with them. So. I love that. I love that she's done that. That's really, (laughs) really, really really awesome. And she has her wine bucket next to her. That's great. Yeah. So hopefully one day we get to the point where it's just on the menu. That would be ideal. Definitely. Definitely. I like that idea. Yeah. So tell me about how you became a change coach um, and started doing the work that you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as I said, I've went through so many of my own personal changes in a quite a short space of time. And along the way, I started to feel really strongly about my own like, life purpose wasn't yeah. really being fulfilled. Like, you know, what was I doing? Um, I realized I've been following others for so long that I didn't know that I could actually leave my own path. And what I did, I kind of started to reflect on what I really loved most about my career. And like I said, I've worked in insurance and then I worked in recruitment. So I was very much around people all the time. And I realized that I loved helping others kind of shine and do really well in their own lives and their career, for example, with the recruitment. It really made me happy and, and fulfilled. And so I decided that I needed to kind of look into another area. And it was life coaching. You know, that was kind of the natural progression. 
And I started to do the certification in that, just sort of focus on supporting and guiding others on, in their own journey. I didn't really have a specific kind of area focus. And then the change thing kind of happened naturally because, because I have gone through so many of my own changes, I felt like actually I could, I'm in quite a good place to actually offer guidance and support with people mm-hmm. going through their own. And it could be changes that they choose to make themselves you know, habit changes or lifestyle changes, or it can be changes that have been put on us, you know, it's shocking, you know, like grief and, you know, what's happened with COVID, you know, that's right. just been the biggest change in the entire world in all of our lifetimes, hasn't it? Um, so things like that. So that's how I got into the change coaching. And then also I discovered, I mentioned meditation and I really, really was drawn to that. I absolutely loved it. It became something that I did regularly um, for my own practice. And I decided that I wanted to develop that a little bit more and help my clients with it. So the aim was really just to give them a few extra techniques. So I wasn't really thinking about, you know, anything other than that. And I did a, a short but very intense training uh, a few days in Dubai and it was just the most special few days I've ever experienced. You know, we were kind of in this room, these women together, and uh, I think there's one man as well. And we just bonded like incredibly. This it was just so special. And I think after we'd had the we'd had the kind of lockdown, it was nice to be around people as well. But not just that we connected so much because meditation is so deep, and we did a lot of meditating in a short space of time and. Yeah, it was, it was quite powerful stuff. And I went away kind of with a whole just new kind of take on everything on, on, on meditation and how it, how it could help others as well and myself. And my life path just kind of started having other ideas really for me. And I ended up becoming certified. I did another course, a different course with a lovely guy from America, Scott Moore. He is a yoga teacher and he also does yoga nidra. So I joined his course and ended up specializing in yoga nidra, which is an ancient, very ancient. It goes back to 700 to 1000 BCE. Yeah, it's an ancient practice and it's all focused on awareness and relaxation. And that's kind of where I've where I've basically found my, my home there. And then along the way as well, I also developed this movement meditation. And I mentioned earlier, this it's called Let's Shake and Flow. And that, again, that kind of came out of nowhere. I just became quite influenced by things. I saw, I think I did the shaking once in a kundalini. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I need to do this more and find out more about it. And, and so I just read up so much about it and realized that it's just, it's actually just something we can do. You know, it's our own natural response to the release of um, stress tension and even trauma when we do our shaking and so what I did I just kind of developed my own version of this and you know I love music so I brought the music into it so we go on a bit of a journey do a bit of flow movement with it as well because it's an energetic kind of release of um, energy that gets stuck in our body so it's kind of like a movement class. And then what we do, we end with the yoga nidra at, at the end. So it's, kind of, it's quite powerful and awareness, movement of energy. Yeah. And that's, that sounds that's so where amazing. I, I would love <laughs> yeah. to experience that. Yeah, I'd love to share it with you. Yeah, it's, um, it's very different. It's very new. Um, you know, the combination as well of, of doing nidra with this as well um, is different. I often do nidra on its own as well. Yeah. But that's a lot longer um, practice. But this is kind of my passion, I suppose. You know, the, the share, sharing the shake is my passion, showing people how easy it is to, to feel good about themselves in an instant um, is, is quite um, where I'm at, really. You know, so yeah, I'd love to get this whole world to shake. <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. I have one more question for you. So if you had any advice for someone who wants to start a sober journey, what advice would you give them? Yeah. So gosh, don't be afraid to be different is a big one. You know, um, we are stepping out of a slight of a comfort zone here and the world hasn't quite caught up with us yet. Um, so just, you know, that's my big one, just kind of let go of all those kind of fears of being different. It's actually kind of fun to be different, you know, and stand out a little bit from the crowd. Um, also, if you need to as well, maybe find people 
that you can be comfortable with not drinking around uh, yeah. because you, that's something that does come out quite clearly when we stop drinking is who our kind of friends are and the people that we want to spend time with are. So, you, you know, just kind of be aware of that. Another top tip I would say is read loads of the sober lit. There's a whole genre now, isn't there? You know, there's yeah. tons and tons of available books out there. Um, so definitely just go online and just look at them. But my ultimate kind of advice would just be to kind of create your create a life that you just don't want to regularly escape from. Make it so awesome that you just don't feel the need to even want to have a drink or get drunk. And then, yeah, just enjoy it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. That's great advice. And it's funny that you say that create a life you don't need alcohol to escape from. Cause I describe, that's what I describe my programs as a lot. Um, oh. it's like all well, my programs. So it's, um, I'm totally on the same page. Like you got to find all the things you love and enjoy and feel so good about yourself that you don't want to, you know, go to wine or go to alcohol to numb yourself from, yeah. from whatever's going on. Yeah, exactly. It's just an exciting kind of new world awaits. Well, Amy, it was so amazing to meet you and um, chat and find out that we actually have so much in common. Um, And I really hope that we meet in real life soon in the UAE. Me too. Me too. Thank you so much for having me on, Alex. It's been great fun and sharing this kind of sober journey as well. It's not something I've done. um, So thank you. Oh, I've maybe on blogs, but not here. Live (laughs) like this. It's amazing. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being open and vulnerable. I'm sure a lot of people will get a lot from this episode. So thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye.